The Library of Alexandria, the world's first scientific research center harboring all the wisdom of the ancient world with over half a million scrolls at its peak, until being destroyed by Julius Caesar and fanatical Christians. <laughs> but is any of this actually true? In the light of the current scholarship and available primary sources, one finds that these claims just mentioned are either dubious, very misleading or flat out false, which is why we in this video will analyze the real history of the legendary library of Alexandria. To do this we will use the current scholarship on the subject and the available primary sources to answer important questions surrounding the library of Alexandria. Like what the library of Alexandria actually was? what people we knew worked there, how many scrolls it contained, what really happened to the Library of Alexandria, and why it's not around today. Stay tuned for the end where we will dive deep into the question concerning who's to blame for the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. Sources will as always be listed in the description below for further reading. After the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC, his Jung Empire collapsed into several smaller states. One of these states became the Kingdom of Egypt which was ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty. The capital of this kingdom was the city of Alexandria. Sometime during the 3rd century BC, one of the Ptolemaic kings founded what's called the Alexandria Museum, which was a religious shrine dedicated to the nine muses who were minor classical deities believed to inspire artists. Being a shrine dedicated to the Muses, the Alexandria Museum also functioned as a sort of academic institution where scholars from across the ancient world were hired by the Egyptian kings to do research in various fields such as astronomy, rhetorics, poetry and other subjects. Based on the accounts we have of its interior, we can infer that it likely had a hall with recesses and seats for lectures and private study. It also had a communal dining hall with kitchens, a dormitory and other residential apartments. So where did the Great Library of Alexandria come into all this? Well, you see, what people usually imagine when they think of the Library of Alexandria is this huge single building containing quote unquote all the wisdom of the ancient world. However, the real library of Alexandria was not its own building, but simply a collection of books that was associated with the Alexandria Museum. It was most likely part of the museum complex and according to the scholar Lionel Casson, would have taken the shape of a colonnade with a lineup of rooms behind. The rooms would serve for shelving the holdings and the colonnade provided space for the readers. Being given much support from the Ptolemaic kings, the library's collection quickly grown into one of the largest in the ancient ancient world, even though its real size is often misunderstood. In addition to the main library, the Ptolemies also founded smaller, so-called daughter libraries, on various locations in Alexandria. The most famous one being the library place in the pagan temple known as the Serapium, which we will soon see is very important in understanding who is to blame for the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. There are several known factors that contributed to the library's growth, including sending out agents to score book markets all around the Mediterranean and translating foreign books into Greek. The most legendary factor though is the claim that the Ptolemaic kings went so out of their way to acquire new books that they ordered their agents to confiscate the books arriving on ships in the Alexandrian harbor. The books are said to then have been copied and later returned to their original owner. Now it's possible that this odd practice did occur at some time to some extent, but it's quite unlikely if one takes into account what that actually would have to imply. The whole claim is based upon an allegory given by the 1st century Roman physician Galen, and if the Ptolemies would have tried to pull off something like that, no one would have been willing to take any books with them into Alexandria, since no one would be willing to wait for several weeks for a scribe to painstakingly copy their books on the floor by hand. The Alexandrian Museum was a place where several ancient scholars like Eratosthenes and probably Ptolemy conducted their research. However, several of the claims of the people having worked in the Alexandrian Museum is based on either none or on very slim evidence. In his popular TV show Cosmos from the early 80s, Carl Sagan sings the hymns of the library's great scholars like Hipparchus, Archimedes, Euclid, Dionysus of Phrase and Herophilus. 
However, as interesting as this sounds, it's unclear whether several of these people just mentioned ever visited Alexandria, let alone worked in the Alexandria Museum. All we know of Hipparchus' relationship to the Library of Alexandria is that he used some of the books from the library's collection, and there is no evidence that he ever travelled to Egypt from his home in Rhodes. There is no evidence that Archimedes ever went near the library, and what little we know of Archimedes' life indicates that he spent it in Syracuse. Euclid and Herophilus lived in Alexandria in the first half of the 3rd century BC, and may have studied there depending on when in the 3rd century BC the museum was established, and Dionysus of Thrace is also another maybe, though a more likely one. On the whole, this lineup of great scholars is mainly a hyperbole and speculation rather than historical facts, and you're probably going to be surprised to learn that based on the people that we do know worked in the museum, it's more likely that the Library of Alexandria during its glory days was known for something very different than science. Poetry Looking at the subject specialized in by the Alexandrian librarians, one finds that only Eratosthenes specialized in anything we would call science, while the others mostly focus on literature and grammar, which makes sense when one takes into account the fact that the museum was a shrine dedicated to the muses. Minor gods believed to inspire artists and poets, not scientists. The Alexandria Museum was neither a major center for scientific speculations or technological innovation, which is not only due to the museum scholars being more interested in textual variants than studying physics, but also due to common modern misunderstandings about the nature of Greek science, which I from now on will refer to as protoscience. Most of the Greek intellectual undertaking was based in induction and common sense reasoning, and with the exception of geometry and astronomy, was devoid of measurements and experiments. Most of the Greek protoscience was also a highly abstract and philosophical affair, without any relationship to observations. One good example of this is Greek conversations about atomic theory, which unlike modern atomic theory, was largely an abstract and metaphysical exercise about the philosophical nature of a thing. No Greek philosopher walked away from such a conversation and decided to try to build equipment to explore the physical nature of atomic structures, or considering that different forms of matter were made up of different combinations of atoms, or experiment on these substances and would likely have considered such ideas as absurd. Lastly was Greek protoscience completely separate from the technological advancement in the ancient world, and with the exception of medicine and a bit of astronomy, it had next to no practical function in the ancient society, in the way that modern science has today. If you're any familiar with the history of the Greek Library of Alexandria, you've probably heard people making rather interesting claims regarding how many scrolls that the Library of Alexandria is said to have contained. And this continued for centuries, culminating in half a million to perhaps even a million books. However, estimates conclude anywhere between 400,000 to as much as 700,000 scrolls. How many of these texts would there have been in the libraries? Oh, I reckon uh, half a million. Accurate numbers are difficult to come by. But it seems that the library contained at its peak nearly one million scrolls. So are these claims accurate? Let's look at the evidence. The available primary sources reveals that there definitely are some ancient accounts claiming that the Library of Alexandria's collection of scrolls numbered in the hundreds of thousands. However, one also finds that other ancient accounts claim that the library's collection only were a fraction of what's commonly claimed, which leads one to ask which of these contradictory accounts is the correct one, with the most likely answer being no one. The scholar Diana Delia points out that libraries in the ancient world lacked any sort of modern inventory system, which meant that even if the librarians in Alexandria wanted to count their book collections, they neither have the means nor time to do so, from which it follows that none of the ancient accounts can be considered reliable, but rather as wild guesses and rhetorical flourishes made with numbers, which modern history popularizes uncritically repeats for various reasons. So if none of the ancient accounts are reliable, is there still any way to at least somewhat accurately estimate how many scrolls the library contained? Well, there might just be, and the answer may surprise you. Instead of starting from the ancient accounts, the scholar Roger S. Bagnall has approached the question from a different angle. In his paper called Alexandria Library of Dreams, Bagnall starts with noting how many authors we know of that were writing in the early Hellenistic period. 
We know of around 450 writers whom we know at least some lines of writing existed in the 4th century BC, and another 175 from the 3rd century BC. Bagnall points out that most of these writers probably only wrote around a couple of scrolls each in their lifetime, with a few exceptions like playwrights whose works could fill up to even a hundred scrolls. If we adopt the assumption that every writer in the ancient world wrote exactly 50 scrolls each, which is a very implausible assumption, we would arrive at around 31,250 different scrolls in total that existed during the glory days of the Library of Alexandria, which is a far cry from the supposed over half a million that people usually claim was stored in the Library of Alexandria, and from these calculations Bagnall concludes the following. We must then assume, to save the ancient figures for the contents of the library, either that more than 90% of classical authors are not even quoted or cited in what survives, or that the Ptolemies acquired dozens of copies of everything, or some combination of these unlikely hypotheses. If we were, more plausibly, to use a lower average output per author, the hypothesis needed to save the numbers would become proportionally more outlandish. One way to estimate how many scrolls an ancient library could have contained is by studying the library ruins, and from it calculate how many scrolls it could have contained when it was being used. However, this approach don't work on the Library of Alexandria, since the library's archaeological remains have been erased over the centuries by earthquakes and modernist urban planning in the 20th century. However, this archaeological approach can still be applied to other ancient libraries, which can be compared to the Library of Alexandria. For example, based on an archaeological survey in Rome, Lionel Casson estimates that the library in the form of Trajan could have held around 20,000 scrolls, and based on a similar survey of the remains of the Library of Pergamon, the historian James Hannam estimates that it could have held around 30,000 scrolls. Most people don't know this, but during the Hellenistic era, the Library of Pergamon was actually considered to be a genuine rival to the Great Library of Alexandria, and given that information, a more reasonable estimation of how many scrolls the Library of Alexandria could have contained is around 40 to 50,000 at its height. This would have made the Alexandrian library the greatest library in the ancient world by a wide margin, and thus the source of its renown and later myths, but it's still a far cry from the 500,000 to a million scrolls usually claimed by uncritical popular sources and people with access to grind. Associated with the fantastic claims of the library containing over half a million scrolls is the common idea that the Library of Alexandria was ended in a single cataclysmic event that destroyed much, if not all of the knowledge of the ancient world and completely changed the course of history. The culprits most commonly assumed to be responsible for this is usually Caesar, Alexandrian Christians and the Caliph Omar. So is any of these suspects actually guilty? Well, let's just say that the guilt for the Library of Alexandria's disappearance don't necessarily rest with one single person. Libraries are delicate institutions and anyone who works in library services will tell you that the main enemy to a library's survival is a lack of funding. Ancient libraries in particular need constant financial patronage to avoid ceasing to exist, since papyrus scrolls decay over time, suffer damage from vermin, and it's under constant risk from fires great and small since they were maintained in a time when artificial light had not yet been invented. They also needed a large staff to undertake the unending task of repairing, replacing and recopying scrolls, and these tasks were expensive to maintain since they had to be able to read and write, which was a quality few people in the ancient world possessed. During the library's glory days in the 3rd and 2nd century BC, the labour and upkeep of the institution would generally have been reliable. However, already by the 1st century BC, there's indication that the prestige of the Alexandrian library had begun to decline. This can be seen in the Ptolemaic kings starting to put flunkies and court favorites in the position of museum directors, instead of actual scholars which had occupied a position in the earlier centuries. This process continued after the Roman occupation in the 1st century BC, when the library's patronage probably became even less reliable. However, as important as funding was for the library's survival, war and pillaging definitely also played a part in the decline of the Alexandrian library, which takes us to our first suspect, which is Julius Caesar. 
After having destroyed the Egyptian fleet in 37 BC, Caesar spent some days in the royal quarters of Alexandria until he was unsuspectedly attacked by a group of soldiers still loyal to the pharaoh. Caesar found himself cornered and outnumbered, and in a desperate attempt to pull off a victory, he set fires to the ships in the Alexandrian harbour. The fire spread from the harbour into the city, and is said to have reached the Library of Alexandria. Many primary sources claim that Caesar's actions completely destroyed the library, but whatever effect the fire might have had on the Library of Alexandria, it was most likely limited, since the Alexandrian Museum, in which the library was contained, continued to function many years after the battle had taken place. The scholar Robert Barnes points out that there is a complete silence among contemporary sources regarding the consequences of Caesar's actions, including the writings of outspoken enemies of Caesar, like Cicero. Barnes also points out that many of the primary sources, which are all later in time, contradicts each other when describing the events, and argues that a likely explanation of what happened is that Caesar's actions only led to the burning of a warehouse containing scrolls near a docks, or a comparatively small part of the library, and that this over time was elaborated into a tradition where the whole library was destroyed. Now it's still possible that Caesar's actions burnt down the library of Alexandria, but the theory suffers from several problems just mentioned, and the available primary sources don't offer any conclusive proof for such a theory. So if Caesar is not entirely to blame, when did the library and the museum disappear? Unknown to many, the answer likely lies in the political turmoil of the 3rd century. In 215 AD, the Roman Emperor Caracalla punished Alexandria for mockery of him, with a wholesale massacre of the young men of Alexandria, which was followed by the Emperor's soldiers plundering the city. Whether the museum was sacked in this action is still unknown, but John Mallet records that its funding was stopped by Caracalla at this time. In 272 AD, the city was again sacked when the Emperor Aurelian conquered it from the Palmarine Empire, and then a third time in 295 AD by the Roman Emperor Diocletian. These destructions of the city, together with a loss of funding by the Roman emperors, likely meant that both the Alexandrian library and the museum were a mere memory by the end of the 3rd century. The only mention of the museum after this time is found in a late source which is a 10th century Byzantine encyclopedia called the Suda. The encyclopedia refers to the 4th century philosopher Theon, known for being the father to the famous philosopher Hypatia of Alexandria, as the man of the museum. It's not clear what this title is supposed to imply. Given that the museum most likely had been long gone by the 4th century, it could imply that some other successor museum had been established, and that Theon studied there, but it could just as well be meant to be used as a stylized honorific title, or a personal nickname, meaning a scholar like one from the old days. Okay, so if the Library of Alexandria likely had been long gone by the end of the 3rd century AD, how does it come that Alexandrian Christians and Caliph Omar are still calmly accused of being responsible for its destruction? Let's start with Alexandrian Christians. By the late 4th century AD, Alexandria had become a majority Christian city, and in year 391 the Alexandrian bishop Theophilus tried to close down the pagan temple known as the Serapium, in a campaign against remaining pagan sects in the city. The Serapium was as mentioned earlier a building that at some point in time had worked as one of the Library of Alexandria's daughter libraries. Bishop Theophilus did get permission by the Roman Emperor to destroy the temple, but he did not get any support from the Roman military, and he therefore stormed the temple with a mob of people and destroyed it. So looking at the historical record, it seems like the Christian mob did not destroy the Alexandrian library, but they at least seemed to have destroyed one of its daughter libraries, which had been located in the Serapium. However, in the light of the available primary sources, that's a problematic statement. The first primary source indicating this is the 4th century Roman chronicler Ammianus Marcellinus. He had travelled to Egypt in the middle of the 4th century and had probably visited Alexandria himself. In his written history of the Roman Empire he gives a detailed description of the city, which includes a description of the Serapium. The Serapium, which of feeble words merely belittle it, 
yet it's so adorned with extensive columned halls, with almost breathing statues and a great number of other works of art, that next to the Capitolium with which revered Rome elevates herself to eternity, the whole world beholds nothing more magnificent. In this were invaluable libraries and the anonymous testimony of ancient records declares that 700,000 books, brought together by the unremitting energy of the Ptolemaic kings, were burnt in the Alexandrian War. Here Ramianus is obviously confusing the library in the Serapium with the main library of Alexandria. However, his account is still important because of the way he describes the Serapium library. Notice how Ammianus talks about the library in the past tense, indicating that the library did no longer exist when he wrote down his account sometime in the 360s, which fits well with the accounts we have of the destruction of the Serapium. You might be surprised to learn that we have no less than 5 accounts of the destruction of the Serapium, making it one of the most well documented events in ancient history. However, despite a whole five accounts describing the destruction of the Serapium, none of them mentions the destruction of any library within the Serapium, or even hints at it. This silence is made even more significant by the fact that one of these writers is Eunapius of Sardis. Eunapius was a pagan, a scholar, and a vehemently anti-Christian author, which is manifest in his account of the destruction of the Serapium, where he spares no effort to make Theophilus and the other Christians look as barbaric and foolish as possible. If anyone had an incentive to mention that a mob of Christian fanatics was burning down the last remains of the Great Library of Alexandria, it was Eunapius. However, in his account of the destruction of the Serapium, he never mentions the destruction of any library, or even hints at there being a library there at the time. The accounts of the Serapium's destruction, together with the account of Ammianus, gives a good indication that the daughter library in the Serapium no longer existed when the temple was destroyed in 391. But is there any evidence pointing to the contrary? Well, maybe. Some scholars have tried to argue for the opposite, using the writings of a man called Aptonius of Antioch. Aptonius was a teacher in rhetoric who lived in late antiquity. We know next to nothing of his life, except that he lived in the city of Antioch, between the 4th and 5th century AD, and that he is the author to a textbook in rhetoric called the Prognosmata. In the Prognosmata, Aptonius gives a detailed description of a pagan temple with book storages, indicating that the temple described had a library, which most scholars agreeing must be a description of the Serapium, given the features mentioned in other places in the description. What's notable about the description is that Aptonius is describing the temple and its interior in the past tense, and from that some scholars have argued that Aptonius himself had visited the Serapium some years before its destruction, seeing that the library was still there, to later write down the description in the Prognosmata after the Serapium was destroyed in 391, from which it follows that his description indicates that the daughter library still existed when the Serapium was destroyed. However, there are several question marks surrounding this interpretation. For a start, it assumes that the description was written down after 391 rather than before, which there is no evidence for, and it also assumes that Aptonius' description is based on his own experience when he in fact, as the scholar George Alexander Kennedy points out, could have relied on a written description, which is not unlikely given that the purpose with Aptonius' description is not to give an historical account of the Serapium, but only to give an example of a good rhetorical description. Kennedy argues that this is likely to be the case, and since Ammianus Marcellinus, who visited Egypt in the middle of the 4th century, points to there not being any library in the Serapium at the time, it's plausible that Aptonius did in fact rely on a written description, from which it follows that this argument don't work. So in conclusion is the tale of the Christian destruction of the Library of Alexandria or the Daughter Library not only dubious but is also without any evidential foundation. Closely related to the tale of the burning of the Library of Alexandria is the tale of the brutal murder of the female philosopher Hypatia of Alexandria, which I have covered in detail in a video you can access via the card in the top right corner or in the link in the description below. As for Califomar, you can probably already guess the answer, but it's worth covering quickly anyway. 
In 640 AD, the Islamic Caliph and former advisor of the Prophet Muhammad conquered the city of Alexandria from the Eastern Roman Empire. When discovering the Alexandrian library, he is said to have ordered all of its contents burnt for either being useless or harmful to Islam in a process that lasted for six months. There are two sources that make this claim, both which are written many centuries later. They don't match well with information from the other sources on the Library of Alexandria, and the story contains elements that are so fantastic that one would rather expect to find them in Arab legends, such as the Arabian Nights. Which is why this story is rejected by most, if not all scholars working in the field today. So in conclusion is the popular conception of the Library of Alexandria as a scientific research center and a place harboring all the knowledge of the ancient world, largely a fairy tale cobbled together from disparate elements and bearing little to no relationship to accurate history. The Great Library of Alexandria was not a secular establishment, and not nearly as large as many prefer to claim. It was not a particular center for science, it was not destroyed in one cataclysmic event, but in a long drawn out process that was mainly due to a change in priority among the rulers of Alexandria. The disappearance of the library did also not lead to the loss of all the knowledge of the ancient world, or ushering in some sort of medieval dark age given that the whole concept of the medieval dark ages has been rejected in scholarship for decades, and the idea that a single ancient library could have survived into the modern era is frankly ridiculous, which becomes evident due to the fact that none of the many other ancient libraries did so. The popular tale of the Library of Alexandria is by all means an awe-inspiring story, but when it comes to the conflict between fables and actual history, the later must always take precedence. Today we have covered a lot of information, and now I want to turn it over to you. What new information did you learn of the Library of Alexandria from this video? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you haven't seen it yet, check out my video on the life, death and legend of Hypatia of Alexandria. And don't forget that if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.